Good morning, everyone. Um, let me just make sure everything that I'm doing is working. Yeah, it looks like it's okay. Um, just checking also my audio is coming through before I launch into talking about anything. I know I've got a bit of, um, usually a tiny bit of a delay in the streaming to see if everyone is in the audio. Alright, got a few people answering at least, and answering with the same thing that I said, which is good morning, which probably means my audio is working, but I'll just like check. Okay, good. So, <laughs> yes, so a lot of people are telling me things are okay. Well, sometimes I find it a bit weird doing this sort of live streaming thing, because um, I'm just sort of sitting here in the comfort of my own home. Um, it doesn't have the same kind of, I don't know what I would call it, the same kind of resonance as you would have in a lecture theatre where there's this really kind of obvious um, performer and audience dynamic going on. Uh, so I think this one will be interesting. Um, this talk is one I, this is the fourth time I've given this at UNSW now. Um, and I slowly tune, oh wait, no, it's the fifth time I've given it at UNSW. I think I've given it to, three times to Comp 151 and once to, uh, once to teaching staff at UNSW. So, I can't even remember why I started giving this talk, but I know that it happened when I was, I think at some point, just having, a, 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 openly just having a rant about the fact that we teach certain things and we focus really, really heavily on teaching certain things and testing people on certain things. And then all my experience um, working as a software engineer uh, and a systems engineer, I worked as a slightly different shift on engineering and just seeing what actually happens in tech companies and things like that and talking to a lot of friends who, because I, I reached a certain point in, in my career where my friends weren't just the people working places, they were the people hiring other people to work places and so my friends started being the people who were hiring grads. It became very interesting to see what criteria people were hiring people on. And the thing that, that that sort of, I think, struck me the most is that what people were hiring people on wasn't necessarily what we were teaching. Um, we get caught up in this idea that when you, um, when you teach people, you need to assess them. And if you need to assess them, you need to kind of give them an assignment or lock them in a room and, and, and force them to prove their capabilities. Um, as an aside, this term, none of you will be locked in a room to, comp to prove your capabilities, and so somehow we're actually going to have to assess you on something slightly more professional, which is, can you write code, etc., or can you show your knowledge while you have the entire internet backing you up? So can you show your abilities while you have Google? Um, and I think that's going to be a, an interesting challenge because generally when we ask people to show their knowledge while they have something like Google available, what we get back is whatever Google tells people to do rather than what they actually thought of themselves. But that's a different thing. That's something that we'll, we as the academics at CSE are working out right now, how, we, how we're actually going to examine you at the end of this term. Because when we can lock you in a room, it's very easy. Because we lock you in a room and say, well, you can't look anything up, so everything that we're assessing you on is literally what's in your head. And so we can say, this person 100% knows this. Um, and so the difference is when we say, this person knows this when they have Google and the internet and when they can go back and look at the lecture slides and things, um, that's a very different way of assessing people. The stuff I'm talking about today is not in the exam. So there's going to be a significant percentage of you here who are from Comp 1511. There's going to be a significant percentage who have come via the CSE SOC. So this was going to be a talk where I invited CSE SOC into my Comp 151 lecture, and and we all got together and um, and I talked about this. It's really not going to be in your exams for any other subjects either. And the deep irony 
of what I'm talking about today and it not being in the exams is that the things I'm talking about today are generally the main criteria that people have when they're hiring someone uh, into a tech company. So let's get into it and let's talk about some of the things that I want to talk about today. So, oops, <laughs> I love how I dramatically do that and I press the button and I didn't actually have the slides in focus. I've got all my streaming software over there in focus at the moment. So what does it mean to be a professional engineer? I've kept this pretty open actually because sometimes I say professional programmer, professional computer scientist, that kind of thing. I guess I could say computer scientist if I wanted to, but engineer as well. I mean, most of the people who are doing computer science degrees will end up getting hired as an engineer at this point. But that's not even, I don't think this is open enough. I should have just taken the word engineer off here and said, what does it mean to, to just be a professional? I think it's sort of also important to think about the statistic because your time in CSE, if you're a CSE student, or even your time in, um, in engineering, if you're a student who does engineering and happens to do some programming, who's here as well, um, will, will leave you with this idea that your ability to write code or your ability to do raw technical stuff is the most important thing that you've learned. As a graduate, it might be reasonably important, it might be a little bit important, because you'll have to jump over a hurdle with your technical skills to get through an interview process. Um, but it's actually not going to be what you're hired on. So these are four things. And I've put these together into these four things based on the kind of things I've been told over time by friends who are hiring people. Um, the things that I've seen um, happening and also the fact that um, what are we looking at like if we look at major software companies you look at your big sort of Google Atlassian and Microsoft Facebook Apple and all of those and think about how many people in the organization actually write code for a living um, or if you look at the other I think one of the other big hires we have of our um, computing grads at UNSW is the consulting firms as well. So your your Accenture's, your PwC and all of those companies and, and the big banks in Australia. When you consider how many of the the, the percentage of people in those companies actually write code, uh, it, it's definitely not 100%. It's, it's usually actually nowhere near 100%. Um, if you're talking about the pure software company, someone like Atlassian, you're still only looking at, I'd say, I haven't asked, but I'd say it's about 60-70% of people uh, are writing code for a living. Um, other people are doing other jobs as well. Um, and those jobs are vitally important to make companies like that work. Like I would never argue with it, that Atlassian is not a successful company, so I would accept whatever ratio they wanted to hire their staff in. And they consider it a significant amount of importance to have a lot of staff there who are not writing code and are doing other quite vital uh, roles in the company. So I get this kind of question sometimes from people in computer science. Uh, you may have noticed by now that I may have slides up, but I'm going to talk from um, I'm going to talk from my experience. I'm going to kind of talk from the heart a bit more in this um, uh, in this talk today, especially because I usually have to cram this in in a Comp 151 lecture in between technical things. But today. Um, I have uh, I have a significant like uh, significant more amount of time to be able to do this. Um, just checking out there is is the stream going okay? Because YouTube is saying there's errors here and things might be buffering, so. Um, let me know if things are going all right out there or not. Um, I assume that someone will just message me in chat if something's going wrong, but I think I've got some lag, um, which strangely enough is going to happen when I think everyone's now online, working online and doing school potentially online as well. So we'll see how we go. Okay. So four things. Um, that I've come up with over time. 
Okay, a few pauses, nothing too bad. Buffering a little. Okay, cool. I'm going to hope it's not too bad. Some people are saying it's working reasonably fine. Um, yeah, you might end up a couple of seconds behind because of my buffering. So hopefully that's fine. I mean, like, we're, we're always a couple of seconds behind on a live stream anyway, so hopefully we'll be okay with that. Okay, so four things that have come up a lot as, um, yeah, a bit of static. Okay, so my, um, let's, uh, let's try to distance the camera a little. I know it's bad form to pick up the camera when you're in a live stream. I'm trying to distance the camera from the laptop a little bit, because the laptop has a very hefty fan. I don't know if that did anything. Yep, it is my fan going crazy. Oh, I'm gonna try this. Uh, can you still see me? You can still see me. I just put it up on the windowsill up there. I don't know if that means it's now going to pick up more more background noise. Um, but it's much further away from the fans now. Uh, how's that for everyone? I'll just give everyone a sec for everything to buffer and, and people can see me and see how that's going. You see a lot more of my room now, actually. <laughs> House tour at the end. And now you can hear traffic noises because I'm up in the window. Hang on, hang on, let me shut the window. Okay. Compromise. Strangely enough, I don't have a full video recording studio at home. Um, I need to get one of those streamer setups with like a green screen in the background and stuff like that. Okay. Okay, we're better now. Okay. I mean, like, I shut the window, but there also just happens to be no cars going past right now, so who knows. Right. Okay, okay, let's con let's continue. Also, now you get to... Okay, if you want a house tour, there's my comics, books, model kits, Transformers, and other things like that. There's bonus marks for anyone who could identify all the stuff that's behind me. Um, there's a bunch of musical instruments over there from all of my different potential careers that I've had in my life. Anyway, <laughs> we're not going to do a house tour. Um, okay, so going back to the football, I love how I haven't even got through the first slide yet. Um, okay, so the four things that have come up most often as um, the, um, the things that people thought were the most important uh, when they were choosing who they wanted to work with. Um, and I think this is an interesting thing, is that when someone is going to hire you to work with them, they are not hiring a set of skills, they're hiring a human being, and they're also human beings, so they're going to hire someone who they think that they could spend the next couple of years sitting next to, and not want to, like, I don't know, tear them limb from limb, or quit the job themselves because they have to work with this person. So some of the things that I think are important for people who who want to have a good time doing what they're doing. And I want to say it like that, right? Because like I think that a lot of people may be coming into coming into this talk thinking, okay, Mark's gonna tell us how to get jobs. I am kind of gonna tell you how to get jobs, but I don't just want you to get jobs. And this is one of the things that um, I find students fall into most easily is because you've never had a full time tech job. If someone offers you a full-time tech job, you tend to take it. And then a couple of years in, you go, oh, wait, wait, I want a good job, not a job. I want something that I like and something that I care about doing. And I want to be, I want to be respected in what I do. I want to be able to do good things and then have, have the people around me um, have confidence in me because of what I can do. And these things, I think, are where we get to what's more important than getting a job or not getting a job, is um, long-term fulfillment. So if you... And, you know, how, okay, there's this stupid phrase that's like, um, love what you do and then you'll never work a day in your life. And that's like, that's actually, that's kind of bullshit. But it's, it's not really about that. If you happen to love it, 
that's okay. Um, but you can love things and not necessarily get paid for them. And, and that doesn't mean that you should or shouldn't do it. You can love things and you, that, that you definitely should not take as a job. There's plenty of things that people love that they should not get as a job. And, and I know this because I do a lot of, um, I do a lot of art. Let's just, more house tour stuff. So there's my painting setup down here. So a lot of people know that I paint miniatures for fun. And um, there's my setup there. Here's, here's what I've been working on in while I've been in lockdown. I wonder if you can see that. It's probably not going to focus on it. Yeah, yeah. Little, little toy soldiers and stuff like that. One of the worst things that I could possibly do is start doing that for money and start charging people for it. That would actually take all the happiness out of that. Um, but I do suggest to everyone that having a hobby on the side that's not programming is a very healthy thing to do. Um, you don't really want to be programming 24 hours of your life. And I'm looking at the people I can see in the chat there, and I know several of them in here are doing that. Yeah, looking at you, Tom. <laughs> and um, it's good to have a break, and it's good to be able to do other things. Um, Michael's asking me, do I have a good job? Um, sometimes. Sometimes it's the best job in the world. Um, sometimes it's absolute hell. And I have a feeling that that's not that bad a place to be in for some people. So for me personally, if it's not really hard, then I'm going to get bored. So if I had nothing to complain about working full time as a lecturer, then I would probably quit because it would be like, all I'm doing is just delivering the same content again and again and again, and this is getting boring. Um, if, if it was hell all the time, so if the last couple of weeks, or particular parts, I think, of Term 2 last year, where I tried to do more work than I should have, um, were happening all the time, then I, again, I would also quit there, because that's not the kind of thing that I can handle. Um, if someone had told me, in, in O-Week, for example, Comp 1511 is going fully online. I would have said, here is my resignation. Thanks very much. Uh, this is not something that I care to do right now. And I consider myself to have been highly disrespected by having this forced on me at short notice like this. So instead, we did it in week four, at the end of week four before week five. Um, and we did it with less time uh, with no preparation and very little chance to to teach the tutors how to transition into online teaching. And I've seen this happen to them. I've seen them in the back background of Com 151 say to me, I don't know if what I'm teaching is working anymore because it's online now. I really don't know if this is working. And so if that was going to be situation normal, I would say this is um this is this is very difficult. That weekend was very stressful. Um, However, the way that it goes normally, I think that for me, being a lecturer in, here in CSE is like one of the most fulfilling things that I can do. And I was happy to take Comp 151 online between weeks four and five, just because there's a difference between, say, the university forcing me to do this or me understanding that the world has forced us all into this and the best thing that I can do for my students is to take this course online to put myself and my teaching staff through hell uh, to, to try to make sure that people can continue to get their education even though they can't leave their homes and we can't gather. I think that's an interesting way to look at things because one thing that I've had to decide I Michael, you are taking me so so far off track here, but anyway, um, I think this is what people want out of this, because I've got two hours to give a half hour talk now, so I'm, I'm happy to just talk about a whole lot of things. Um, I said once, and I think that this was what I said to myself when I accepted the full-time position at UNSW, because uh, I worked here as a casual for a year as a lecturer before that, so that was last year to this year. I said to myself, I'm okay 
with getting fired from my job at UNSW if it's because I um, I did what I thought was right for the students. So I decided to hold um, hold my students at a higher level of respect than I have for my continuing employment or for any kind of larger organizational um, uh, needs of the university. And I have a feeling that everyone at UNSW who is really specific about teaching, everyone who who considers teaching to be their calling is going to think the same way. And you're going to know, you're going to know the high school teachers who acted like this as well. Um, you know the lecturers who act like this as well because there's there's like the university's rules and then there's that lecturer's rules and you'll see how they're just subtly different. And that lecturer has said, no, the only thing I care about is whether you learn something or not. And the university is set up, hopefully, to make sure you do that. Like, it, it is reasonably set up that way. But we're, um, we're given at least a certain amount of autonomy in what we do to be able to kind of dictate our own terms on that. So, yeah, so that's the really, really long answer to Mark, do you have a good job? Um, and I'm still never going to answer that definitively. Uh, I think it's a great job. I think it has a lot of challenges, which is the kind of thing that fulfills me. Um, I think it's a little bit life-consuming, um, but I don't know if I'd be happy if it wasn't. So, yeah. <laughs> Let me see what's happening in chat. There's lots of stuff happening in chat. Uh, house tour. Tom saying... Oh, Tom's saying that we've met lots and that he's never, um, uh, he's never gotten to see the miniature painting. <laughs> people are, people are saying Mark is actually being real. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, oh, someone's asking, how can I know that I'm suitable for teaching? This is a really good question, and I think, um... I think you'll probably find this out if you try it a little bit. Um, and see whether you get the buzz. So, there's something that you feel when, um, when students start to get it. So when, when you see them start to understand something, when they go from not understanding something to understanding something, and you know that it's because you brought them through this process. So you got them to the point where they understand something they didn't understand before they spent time with you. Uh, that, if that feeling is the most important thing in the world to you, then you know that you're there for teaching. Um, and that's it for me. Like, I've spent a lot of time... Um, changing people's minds about the world and I think that's a really really weird thing to do um, and you don't you don't sort of realize until you do it and then you sort of get I was about to say you get addicted to it but it's not an addiction it's a fulfillment and those are very very different things right so I don't really I don't want to confuse it with an addiction I want to say that it's the it's the fuel that drives you it makes you into the person that you are Whereas an addiction is something that takes you away from who you are and makes you dependent on something. Um, whereas this, is, this isn't an addiction. It's, it's something that makes you want to continue doing it. And then if you have that motivation, it doesn't matter if you're good at it or not. I'm actually jumping into so much stuff that's in my slides later on, actually. I think I find this quite interesting. You should know also that the first time ever I gave this talk, it was because a bunch of students were sitting around somewhere and I had a chat with them and they said what is it that gets us a job and so the first time I ever gave this talk there was no script there was no slides or anything I just um, I just gave it like I'm giving it today actually and I think today you're getting a very very unique perspective on this just because I'm sitting in the comfort of my own home we set aside two hours for something that I've managed to squeeze into a 20 minute half hour talk before which means I know I've got enough time to actually actually talk about things from my own perspective and, and talk about things properly, I think. So anyway, a couple of other things people are 
asking me about. Oh, no, no, that's it there. Yeah, so, how do I know that I'm suitable for teaching? You will decide for yourself. Um, because it's not necessarily if you're suitable or not, it's more if you want to or not. So, teaching, for example, the amount of money that I'm getting as a lecturer, especially because I'm a new lecturer, is less than the amount of money that a significant percentage of you will get in your first graduate jobs. So, I think that that should make something clear there. No one teaches for money, because there's no money in teaching. Um, we do it because it feels right to do. I was gonna say, we do it because we're shit developers. <laughs> it's not true. <laughs> there's, this, there's this old saying, which is like, those who can't do, teach. And I, I'm like, yes, yes, sometimes, but not really that often. Like, I think there's a lot of people who, um, who may not have teaching as their first priority because the UNSW, for example, is a research university. There's heaps of research going on. And one of the things that we want is for those people who are doing all this amazing research in the world to pass on some of their knowledge. So we accept that these people who are specialist researchers are not necessarily going to pass on their knowledge in the same way that a specialist teacher would pass on their knowledge. But that doesn't in any way mean that we shouldn't learn from them. That just means that we want to put more effort into learning from them because they have, they, they, they're pushing the world forward in some way. You know, they're discovering things that no one's ever heard of before. So yeah, if they're not a great teacher, that doesn't matter because what they have to teach is amazing. Um, whereas me, for example, I'm teaching the introductory course. So it's only amazing if you've never seen it before. Um, I'm not doing any groundbreaking research in the background that I'm then disseminating to my students. Uh, so I have to be a better teacher. So what I have to do is I have to bring people into the world of computing and hopefully inspire them to continue. I've said this to my Comp 1511 tutors, and it's a really funny thing um, that I said to them, I can't remember which term this was, but at the start of the term I said to them, I may have said this in most terms to the people tutoring for me, was that I care a little about what technical, what techniques and things that the students can do by the end of Comp 1511, but I care a lot about what they think about computing by the end of it. Um, whether they think they can do it, whether they think they want to learn more about it, um, whether they're inspired to continue doing it. Um, if they've got that and they fail the course because they're not technically capable of finishing everything in the course, I still consider that a success. Because I consider a person that's motivated to learn is going to get good at it later. And it doesn't really matter if they didn't get good at it here and now. I, I, could, I could give you a whole nother lecture on the difference between failing and succeeding at university and how it has nothing to do with whether you fail or pass your courses. But um, actually it's part of this lecture. Let's, let's go on, let's, let's go on. Okay, so I'm going to, um, there's going to be a lot of these asides, because we're half an hour in, I should actually spend some time um, going through these slides and talking about what's in there. Because this is like my, my, my densest meme content in any of my lectures, actually, because I like to put a lot of memes in this particular one. Okay, so the four things that people are being hired on. I spoke to a friend who is a... Um, uh, what is she at the moment? I think she's a CTO at the moment. Um, reasonably small company, so there were only like 30 or 40 people in the company. But she was saying that um, the way that she hires people is very much, um, can we get along? Do I think they're going to get along with the other staff? Um, do I think they're a good person to work with? Are they applied and motivated to what they do? Um, screw what they can do technically. We're going to teach them how to work in our system anyway, so we don't need them to have any technical skills to begin with. So she was like a, a very, very kind of, that's way out on the, on the end of possibilities. But it was really interesting to hear that. Um, and that really sort of justified my idea of what I do in this kind of talk. Sorry. Is that, I shouldn't apologize, I'm going to drink water when I need to when I'm talking. But, um, I found that really interesting, but I also felt very justified uh, in the way that I, look, I, I do this talk, because um, 
that was a really good way to hire people and they're happily successful in their company and you may find that oh oh secrets trade secrets i don't know if they're still doing this google used to do this thing in their interviews um you'd go in in the morning and in the morning you do that tech interview thing where they give you a whiteboard and a text editor they don't even give you an ide they give you a text editor and a whiteboard and a person and they go can you solve this particular tech problem and they'll talk with you about the tech problem because they don't want to know whether you can solve it or not they want to know how you solve things and they want to know how you communicate around your problem solving and stuff like that so that's just one thing that's the standard tech thing anyone here who's done a practice interview um, and stuff like that so microsoft came through recently and did a whole bunch of practice interviews um, who else has been some other people have been been here um, talking about that as well and i think you'll see those but the funniest thing i don't know don't know if they still do this or i'm giving away things is the next thing they do is someone else usually someone from hr or management or something like that will then take you out to lunch so they'll go to the cafeteria the the google teria i don't know if it's called that but i just assume that everything in google is called googly something like everything in mcdonald's like is a mcchicken and and stuff like that i just assume google's the same uh, <laughs> I haven't, strangely enough, I haven't worked with Google. Um, so they will then take you out to lunch and they'll just have a chat with you over lunch. Uh, and a lot of candidates don't realize that that's a significant part of the interview. Is they're like, okay, we've just put you through hell. We've made you code in an environment you're not used to, like intentionally put you in an environment you're not used to. Um, we've put you under pressure and often have given you a, um, a problem to solve that is not intended to be solvable. It's intended to show how you would approach something. Um, and so you're under a lot of pressure and you're about to just kind of wind down for a second and have some lunch and they want to see how you act in those situations. So it's like, are you a mega stress pot? Are you going to complain to all hell? Um... Or are you going to, you know, just hold a conversation and, and have an interesting conversation? Uh, can you get your mind off it? Um, can you get your head out of the problem? Or does relaxing for that moment give you the solution to the problem and are you happy to talk about that? There's lots of different things. So you're going to have to be yourself in those situations um, and figure out whether that's something that fits between you and the company. I don't want to tell you how to act, because um, if I tell you how to act, then everyone will act the same way, and then when you actually start working in a company, you'll find that you're continually trying to act the same way, and that doesn't make any sense, because just, um, just acting the right way in the interview puts you into a situation where you have to try to continue acting that way through the rest of your career, and that doesn't really work. It's still got to be you. Anyway, okay. So, talking about the way people are hiring. Communication, teamwork, resilience. Resilience is a different one. People aren't usually gonna hire you for resilience, but you're going to be hiring yourself for resilience and your technical skills. So I, I, let, I made sure technical skills are still on the list because people are still gonna be checking for those. Um, but you notice that this is a numbered list and I've put it at number four on the list. We'll talk more about resilience. I think that's a really important one. Um, it's a bit of a buzzword bit of a keyword. Uh, we kept, I keep thinking about changing it to something else, but we'll talk about it in detail as we get into it. So, crazily enough, I'm actually finally going to move into the slides. So, communication. Ah, got a couple of people there. Ha! Ha ha! Hashem Academy is asking me, if you're interested in a particular field, but the issue is that you might sacrifice too many things to get in, and even if you get the job, most likely you'll get burned out and lose your interest, do you think it's worth taking the risk? If you know that you're going to burn out and lose interest, then it's definitely not worth taking the risk. But unless you've been there and worked in the field for a while, how do you know? So... That's the difficulty. Um, I usually tell people to try things. Um, I actually used to do a lot of the interviews for um, students wanting to start studying. Um, so you know that like a lot of people get in on ATAR, like they get into computer science on a number, but other people get in via an interview. I used to do interviews like those. Um, and 
I'd occasionally get people who wanted to study computing who hadn't done any computing. And so I would say to them, how do you know if you haven't done any? Especially nowadays, yeah. like, they could seriously go home for, like, five hours or, or even less and look up how to program online. Look up someone else's online lectures. Actually, nowadays, you've got mine. You, you could go through my online lectures and start to learn C and see if it clicks with you and see if it's something that interests you and then you'll know whether you really want to be there or not. As to whether something's going to burn you out, it's weird, right? Because the field that you're working in, the, the subject matter and things like that is not what burns people out. What burns people out is the way that you're asked to work on something, not what it is that you're working on. I mean, I guess I could potentially get burnt out if I was asked to be a professional administrator. Because for me, I am nearly a textbook extrovert. Like, I, I used to say that when I go into lectures, especially when the first lecture back after I've been on break for a while, like the first one this year, was like, <laughs> I'm going to drain their essence. Uh, <laughs> because it's like that, you know, because I get a lot of energy from students. I get a lot of energy from your responses to me teaching and your responses to me um, uh, delivering content to you. So it's really about, um, for me, it's like I get, I get my fulfillment from that. You, yeah. Where was I going with that? Yeah, yeah. So if I was doing the same kind of thing with teaching, except all I was doing was preparing content um, and, say, recording videos and, um, and then doing all the back-end administration, which is one of the things that I find the most difficult as a lecturer, then I would burn out. But because I get this constant feedback from my students, um, there was a thread on Reddit recently, which was very, very nice. Someone just said, hey, Mark's really great. And so I hopped on my unused Reddit account and said hi and stuff like that. Um, that kind of feedback is, is, is something that's really nice for me and keeps me going. But if I did admin all the time, I wouldn't really be okay with that. So I could be in the same job teaching and doing largely administration. So um, you get some of the lecturers who have to do that a lot. Uh, Andrew Taylor and um, John Shepard are both very, very busy with backend administration um, in CSE. So they have to do a lot of that work that, um, that would burn me out. But technically they have roughly the same job description that I do, which is like deliver content to students. So, and they're obviously in the same field. So it's hard to know whether a field is going to burn you out or not, because it might just be the company you're in that's burning you out versus, um, versus a different company or something like that. Um, I would definitely go into a field that I felt, um, I felt both comfortable and happy with. So comfortable means that I feel like I've got enough competence to, to be able to, um, to deliver something that I want to deliver in that field um, and happy with meaning that that field still has openings for me to learn more from and personally if I'm not learning from something then I quit that's how I got ended up at UNSW my last job I'd done everything there was to do in that job um, so I'd been promoted to a level where I was managing the other teachers and stuff like that so well, I haven't been, well, actually that was the point, is I hadn't been promoted, I'd just been asked to do it without getting promoted. So, so it was like, so at that point I was like, okay, let's, um, let's go see if there's somewhere else where I can learn more from it. Also, there's another thing to talk about. I love how, like, we're on this slide, we're not even talking about this slide at the moment, we're gonna get there. Um, I could have just said, uh, Mark is going to talk to camera for two hours, um, come and just ask questions. <laughs> um... Someone said I'm a vampire. Um, do, 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 stack Overflow, copy paste. <laughs> I think there's, people, there's there's lively discussion um, there. I do have slides later on I want to talk about um, this thing called imposter syndrome and how important it is uh, for, for working and professionalism in general. 
I think I should go back to the slides, though. I think I should... I'm not sure if I even answered that question. I think I just launched into talking about other things. Um, your fulfillment is based on what criteria you have yourself for the kind of work you want to do. Your criteria are going to be different from mine. Because um, I program humans, not computers. And you should, you should take that with, like, you know, like, that's actually a really interesting thing, right? So, I was trained to program computers, but I found I was better at putting ideas into people's heads than I was at translating algorithms into code or coming up with algorithms. I did do a lot of that. Um, but I found that I had this kind of niche that when I explained things in a certain way, people really got it. And I learnt a lot about how to do that. And so that ended up being what fulfilled me. And it's not going to be the same for everyone. But finding out what you want to do... This is a question everyone should ask themselves at some point. I said I was going to go back to the slides and I just totally didn't. The question you should ask yourselves at some point is, what do I want? What do I want to do? Maybe what do I want to be? Um, you'll, you'll get asked this question sometimes in your job interviews and stuff like that and it's a worthy question to think about for yourself is like if I fast forward five years into the future where do I want to be what do I want to be doing um, and what do I care about and then you think the next task is for you to figure out how to get there and and that's actually super important because then you've got a reason like people talk about what's the meaning of life right and that's kind of like slightly bullshit question because it's just sort of like I don't know and if you spend too long on that question the answer for some people is nothing and you really really don't want to be going through the world thinking there's no meaning to your life <laughs> stuff gets real bad when you when you have that kind of attitude because if you think that there's no meaning then you stop caring about anything, and that means you stop caring about other people, and that's the root of all evil, you know? But um, if you say, this is what I would like to do with my life, um, I want to commit to, you know, making sure that worldwide pandemics don't happen again in the future. And you say, all right, in five years, I want to be someone who helped in the aftermath of the COVID-19 virus. I want to be one of the people that helped make the world better and made the world more able to deal with that problem in the future. Then you say, all right, maybe I want an app that does mass communication to help people when they're in their lockdowns. Um, maybe I want an app that focuses on human mental health so that people who can't leave their house for months on end don't go into a massive downward spiral. Um, maybe I want an app that um, allows people to track um, exponential uh, transmission of disease and, and make it easier to, to put measures in place to stop that. So what skills do I need to learn to make that app? Um, what other sciences do I need to go into to learn how to... Um, to do the data analysis that's happening behind that app. And then you've got a vision. Uh, you've got a reason to do certain subjects at UNSW. You've got a reason to study certain things. You've got a reason to start trying to gather people together to work on this with you. Um, and that gives you a drive to do things. And I think that a lot of people, that's that's one of the things that, um, that can get you somewhere interesting in doing something that, um, that then afterwards you can look back and say I made a decision for something I cared about and then I pushed towards that as opposed to life has no meaning I'm only at university because I can't think of anything better to do so I guess I'll just do these subjects and then at the end of it I'll look for a job there <laughs> right <laughs> okay um, let me see what's happening in the questions people are talking about Peter's asked me a question, from my experience, do I see that people change course in what they want to study from year to year? Yes, 100%. If you're a first year student, Peter, or anyone out there who is a first year student, um, you don't have to stick around with what you're doing. And this is in my very first lecture in Comp 1511. I tell people, you can 
Well, nowadays you can't because you can't get on campus. Well, you can get on campus, but it doesn't really work as a campus right now. It's like a whole bunch of shut buildings. But you can walk anywhere on campus and throw a rock. Don't throw the rock, but you could, and you'll hit a building where someone is learning something completely different from computer science. Um, you can you can throw a rock and hit the law building and go. That is a completely different field. Um, you can throw a rock and hit material science and go, wow, this is just all about how to use different materials for the different properties. Um, you can throw a rock somewhere else and go, um, social studies, this is how government works. Um, this is how we build an environment that's good for people to live in. Um, all these kinds of things. And you might find that one of them is more interesting than what you're doing. Um, I do really enjoy the idea that some universities in the world will... Um, uh, we'll have the first year of people's degrees be a broad general degree where they're, they're asked to go study things from many different fields and at the end of that they choose one of them. It turns into this hilarious circus carnival of first year courses trying to recruit people into degrees, <laughs> which is a bit messy instead of preparing them from continuing in the degree, but it does give people the chance to swing if they want to. And a lot of people, especially people who come straight out of high school, so they've been institutionalized by high school, and the first year they come out into university, they don't realize they've got a choice. They've got a massive choice in everything. So um, you have that choice and you can take it. And that's a taste of life, right? So I could have, if I'd wanted to, I could have, um, I could have just been a software engineer my whole life. I've got a software engineering degree. I'm good enough at it that I was getting paid for, I don't know, it's the longest job I stayed in was about seven years as a software engineer. So yeah, you can if you want to, but then I jumped because um, it wasn't as fulfilling for me as it was, as teaching was. And the way that the modern world works, like the way that not even your parents, maybe your grandparents would have worked, is they would pick a career and there was much less tertiary education back then. They would pick a career and they'd go into the expectation that they're going to work for it for like 30, 40 years and then retire. And that's it. And they, would, they were defined by their profession and like changing to a different profession was seen as something that was incredibly difficult and something that wasn't something that people would necessarily do. Um, nowadays, we expect all of you to have... I can't remember the exact number, but... It was about eight different careers uh, in the time that you spend from when you graduate to when you retire. So I'm, on, I'm going on three at the moment. So I've been a, an engineer and a researcher and a teacher. And they all, they all came out very differently. Oh, by the way, I was a god-awful researcher. It's a pretty bad student as well, so I mean, I should have known. <laughs> um... <laughs> police is coming for me. <laughs> yeah. With that meaning of life, median mark is 42. Ah, uh, I see where you're going there. I see where you're going there. Yes. Um, R.I.P. Douglas Adams. Uh, anyway, okay, let's get back to, let's get back to actually talking about what's happening in the slide. So, communication. This is something that's very important. Um, one thing that we don't realize Especially when, because we have too many students, uh, we mark your assignments by a program. So we have a program that runs your program and says, does it spit out the right responses when we put in the right inputs? Um, I would love to. I don't have the budget to do this because it would take thousands of hours. But I would love for our marking to be that we, we hardly run your program at all, but your tutor sits down with you and your program and you explain to them what you built and how you built it and why it fits the specification that we have given you. So we don't even auto test because it would be like, you don't have to do things exactly to the outputs, but if you can justify what you're doing, then that's acceptable. That would be what I would consider to be a an ideal marking scheme if I could somehow have so I've got 35 tutors I think if I could somehow have 35 tutors who thought or thought exactly the same way so I'll just find one of my tutors and just clone them like 30 times and then just be like all right do that 
or one person marks all of them. So like with the 700 students we have now, that'd be about an hour each, and so we would just not get the marking done. But one thing that's super important is that we as programmers, we as software engineers, what we're doing is we're solving human problems. So one of the most important things in, in, in any app you might make or any larger scale program that people are going to make, um, the whole point is that somewhere along the line, someone has identified a need. So someone's looked at a human problem and said, this is a problem that humanity has. They have needs. We need to find out a way to, um, to meet those needs. And then the classic thing, and I'm calling all of you out here because you know who you are. <laughs> you start coding something, and at the very beginning, you are thinking about the human need. And then partway along, you're like, oh my god, there's this cool algorithm. I want to implement this cool algorithm. And then they implement this cool algorithm. And then you look back and you just go, how did that algorithm have anything to do with our needs? How did that algorithm have anything to do with the problem that we were supposed to be solving? And you just kind of go, I'm not sure, but I really enjoyed doing that. And then you get blockchain. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I just love it. Blockchain's really cool, by the way. It's really useful. It's a really nice democratic way of um, confirming that something is legitimate. But I do like the fact that it came out of just like a cool idea. And then they came from the cool idea to try to figure out how they could apply it to human needs as opposed to the other way around. Um, I tend to try to think of things the other way around. It's like, let's look for problems that we have in the world and then try to solve them rather than let's have some really cool tech and then see if we can apply that to the world's problems. Um, so that's what happened with deep learning as well. It's like someone mashed up a neural network in a way that shouldn't theoretically have made it any better, but magically did. That just shows you how well humans understand neural networks, by the way. Um, and then they were like, oh, this is wonderful, this is amazing, now let's see what we can apply it to. And then it's much harder to see what human problems you can solve. Having said that, they're probably going to solve lots of them. Um, <laughs> there's, there's a bunch of people... Um, lots of little questions in there. Hey Tom, I'm just going to let you answer a lot of those questions in there so that I can keep talking about this stuff. Okay. <clears throat> so, if you are unable to communicate what your program is doing to humans, it immediately becomes less useful. Because you're never really going to be working on your own. Actually, I have another slide here. We're going to be problem solving in teams. So the only way that we're going to be able to problem solve together in a group is that everyone understands what the problem is. And everyone also understands what everyone else's approaches are to that same problem. And so that's all about, from, from very much a programming perspective, can you take this less than understandable thing? Because we have to put so much effort into code to make it understandable. But if you don't put effort into your code to make it understandable, it's nigh on useless. Because the only person that's any good for is you. Um, and no one else can use it. So we put a lot of effort into this because if we as a group working on something together, let me just move this so you can read it all. Um, we need to be able to, to talk to each other about it. And this is something that is, is actually really important to practice is can you explain what your programs are doing to people who don't code? And I think people are, especially if you're in first year, you're gonna know plenty of people who don't code. Those of you who are in second and third year who have been fully indoctrinated into C CSE SOC will probably not know anyone who doesn't code anymore because like, you'd just be like, no, I've got my coding friends now. My old high school friends are worthless to me. They're gone, right? Don't do that. <laughs> They're still your friends. They can be interesting people to talk to about your code. So you know if, they, if you can't get through to them about your code, then you need to think about how you're communicating. Um, because as I said, a significant percentage of the people in your companies are people who don't code. And a significant percentage of people who need code written are people who don't code. Because if they needed code written and they did code, then they wouldn't pay you to do it. They'd probably just do it themselves. Um, well, 
not always, you know, people have got different demands on their time. So if you are going to address human needs, human problems, you need to be able to talk to those humans, figure out what their problems are, start writing code to fix those problems, explain how your code's going to help these people and see whether it actually works for them or not. So you can see how like the significant portion of that uh, is communication. It's not necessarily your, your design and implementation of your code that's important. It's making sure that you're going back and forth and, um, and, and, and making sure you're actually solving the problem that the people had. Um, this is why we have product managers. Uh, I, I'm assuming that a lot of people know what a product manager is, um, but if you don't, a product manager is a person on a software team, um, and it's usually someone who's trained as a, as a software engineer like everyone else. Um, but their role in the team is not necessarily to build the code or design or manage the team or anything like that. Their job is to stand in for the client. Correct me if I'm wrong here, because like <laughs> I'm just saying what I think product managers do. I haven't worked as one. Um, but from what I see is that their job is to stand in for the client and make sure that the client's needs are represented within the team. Um, because obviously, if we're not representing the client's needs, then there's a very good chance that we go off and make something which we think is cool we make something cool, we thought it was cool, it was interesting for us to make, and then it doesn't solve the problem. It just goes off and does some random thing. Um, and it doesn't fit the way that they want to solve the problem, uh, and we have, we've we forgotten to communicate, that kind of thing, and that's why we have someone who has that perspective. And very often, your product manager is going to be fully hands-off. Like, they won't touch the code at all, so there's zero risk they're going to get also caught up in that, oh, we're making a cool thing, and then you're like, you've driven off the road, and you're just barreling through the bush somewhere in a random direction, when all you had to do was stay on the road and you would have gotten to your destination. Um, the product manager is there to make sure you stay on the road, they're like a navigator. Um, so, this is like what I'm talking about here, the ability to explain our code is important, because it keeps us closer to the problem we're trying to solve. Um, yeah, so that's one thing, and you're definitely going to be hired on that. Like, your your job interview is going to be them talking to you, right? Neil, the most of the majority of the job interview, you're going to be in a conversation, and someone's going to expect you to be able to explain your code. Um, and also, there's no point having code if you can't explain it. Ha! Neural networks. <laughs> I kid, there's a lot of work going in to try to pull them apart and try to figure out what the hell's actually going on inside them. Um, it's difficult work, so a lot of the smartest minds in the world are, are, are hammering on that one trying to figure out how it works. Okay, so we've had a lot of um, questions there. Original game reviews. Ooh. I'm assuming that you're a student who also has a side, a side gig reviewing games. Okay, communication. I recognize it's generally more difficult for product project managers to understand what you're working on. What are some tips you have for communicating your work to them? And Tom's clarifying stuff about uh, um, project managers as well. Um, and it's not always guaranteed that they have a software engineering background. Um, they may have a design background because design is very human focused as well. Um, so trying to explain something really technical, and we have to assume that we're explaining it to someone who is not technical. We, we assume completely that someone's not technical because the smaller a team you're in, the less likely you are to have a product manager and the more likely it is that someone who's doing the actual programming is in direct contact with the clients. So back, back in the day, we used to do things like requirements engineering. So trying to figure out what our code actually needed to do and by, by having conversations with clients or by outlining the problem really carefully, like big whiteboard sessions and stuff like that. So tips for explaining complicated um, programming terms to, um, to people is there is usually a physical analog to any programming situation. So whenever I talk about, like when we talk about the fundamentals of what a computer is, it's a thinking bit and a remembering bit. 
right? So we have our memory that sits on a computer somewhere, and we have a thinking bit, which is, our, which is our CPU. We can we can lay out memory like it's on a piece of paper. We can say, okay, so we've got this thing here, and then it talks to this thing here. We can broke, break up program components into like boxes and diagrams. So visual, um, um, visual explanations that have some analogy to the physical world will usually be understood better than um, procedural explanations of things. So a procedural explanation is like, it does this, then it does this, then it does this, then it does this. And um, anyone who studies human psychology, cognitive load, that kind of thing knows that there's a limited number of those steps you can put in front of someone before they simply don't understand it. Uh, this includes all of us who are programmers as well, whether you're technical or not, there's a limited number of those steps you can see at once. If you have a diagram, it's much easier because you can say, these boxes do things and they have arrows between them that like say, okay, this one sends information to this one, to this one, to this one, that kind of thing. Then you put a box around those and you go, this whole thing is the thing that does this larger scale concept and then it connects to these other things. Then people can step back and compartmentalize. So you're allowing people to think with the, the limited meat brain that we have. The, the limited meat brain has, has god awful RAM. So the computer has like say, this one I've got in front of me has got 16 gigs of RAM and it has perfect memory. It can just move things in and out of its memory happily and stuff like that. Um, your meat brain has a really weird one which measures the number of concepts that it can hold at once and the maximum number for that is about eight. Um, you'll notice the best designed websites and their menus never have more than eight things in them. And if they need more things, you click on one of those things and it opens up another box that has a maximum of about eight things in it. Uh, if anyone's interested in this, HCI is where, um, where you learn all this stuff within the computing faculty. Although I think this is going to be coming in more in the design subjects that you're doing nowadays. Um, hopefully. Design is about making stuff that works for humans, so hopefully that stuff will be will be this kind of thing. It's like, understand how humans work, understand how not to overload them, um, and then you'll get your best way of communicating with humans. I hope that answers the question at least a little bit. Um, I explained to a five-year-old, that's kind of handy. Oh, that's a big question, Jimmy Neutron. Are you actually Jimmy Neutron? <laughs> With the ongoing pandemic, would companies be reducing intakes? I assume that right now they are, because it's harder to um, it's harder to interview you right now, and also it's nigh on impossible to move you to a different country. Um, so yes, now might be an awkward time to be looking for a job. Except the other thing is that a lot of companies who are based in online resources and stuff might be doing a lot more business now because they might be in a situation to um, to need more people. But I really don't know. Um, I, I don't have my finger on the pulse on the job market right now because obviously I'm not applying for anything. Like I'm here doing my job at the moment. Um, but I would say if you want to know about that kind of thing, talk to people in CSE SOC because if anyone knows what's happening with internships and stuff like that at the moment, it's them because there are a lot of the people who are regularly applying for them and things like that. Um, having said that, here's hoping that the pandemic reaches a conclusion before, say, the end of the year. That's all I can say about it because I, I have really no idea what's going on other than, like, Australia is two weeks away from flat-out madness. Um... <laughs> <laughs> and we're barreling towards it happily, pretending nothing's going to go wrong. Well, some people are, which is which is a little bit scary. Um, but I think that the world will recover. Um, I think we're still waiting for someone to come up with a vaccine so that everyone, those of us who haven't left our house in two weeks, um, going crazy. Um, those of us who haven't left a house for, say, six months by the end of this thing, We'll then get a vaccine and will not um, will not ever pick up the virus. Um, we're putting a whole lot of trust in the medical professionals in the world to to save us at the moment. So, if you have any friends that are working in anything like that, um, doctors, nurses, med techs, anything like that, please um, 
send your love from a distance. Don't touch them. Don't touch anyone. <laughs> okay, okay. Let's let's go back. Okay, so I've talked about communication. Um, I think I've talked enough about communication, and hopefully I've I've impressed on you the importance of it. Because if we don't communicate, then we don't understand each other's problems. And if we don't understand each other's problems, we can't help fix them. Okay, teamwork. I'm gonna move my move my face again. These slides obviously were made before I knew I was going to be live streaming this, so my face was in different places. Um, I, I didn't need to leave space for my face anywhere. Um, so there's an interesting statistic that teams that got along well I wonder, I wonder if I had this in the next slide oh it doesn't matter I'll have to look at that in a second um, so a group of people were put into different teams and asked to do simple tasks one way that they were potentially put into these teams um, I can't remember the exact example, the exact research I should actually look it up again so I can cite it when I'm talking about it um, but they decided one way to do this was to just rank everyone. So this would be analogous to me taking the the wham of everyone who's in this talk right now, and then putting all the top wham together, all the, the middle ranking wham together, and all the lower ranking wham. Just just put you all together based on this measure of your capability. I'm gonna we'll put that in quotes because it's kind of bullshit. But you know, I can't. Yeah. You knew you knew you were signing up for Mark's real talk this this these two hours anyway, so I'm happy to just kind of deliver real talk. Um, Wham's mostly bullshit. Um, if I was to do that, then we would get some teams we expect to do well, some teams we expect to do badly and stuff, but the results would be pretty random because um, there's plenty of people with really high Wham who do not remotely give a shit about working with other people. Um, so I get a lot of people who complain about group work, and I know students love to complain about group work. Um, and the hilarious thing about complaining about group work is uh, you're complaining about the rest of your lives. You've been living up to a certain point in a world where you're focused on as an individual. Um, those of you who have larger or closer families will know that that's not the case. You've never been focused on as an individual. <laughs> You've always been babysitting someone, or being babysat by someone, or have a lot of close relatives and cousins and stuff like that. So you've never been like, like, um, forced to be a, to be alone and work on your own on things so much. Um, but those of you who have been kind of working on your own for everything, um, that's kind of over. Now that you hit university and beyond, you're very very rarely going to be in a situation where you're working alone. Even programmers who try to make things on their own. I'm thinking of examples mostly in like the independent game scene because I know those examples. Anyone ever played Braid by a guy named Jonathan Blow? Even he, as a solo game developer, still worked with an artist and a, and a musician on, on a game like Braid. Um, and he showed his hilarious inability to communicate and compromise with people in, um, in a whole lot of forums and stuff afterwards where he would answer every forum post that was made about his game and basically tell people that they were playing it wrong. So I was like, you don't understand my art, so you shouldn't play it. <laughs> As opposed to the understanding that if you're putting out there into the world then people are going to use it in whichever way they want. And if you really wanted it to go a certain way, then maybe you should have designed it that way. Um, but yeah, none of you are going to be working alone. Um, we put a fair bit of group work into stuff at UNSW in the hope that people will gain an understanding of this. Um, people's first understanding of group work is usually something along the lines of, Ah, that was crap! Um, I had someone that never turned up, and I hate that person, and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, welcome to forever. The only difference is, um, when we have that person, uh, we usually don't have a choice about whether we're going to work with them or not. We're going to get hired into a company because the company, the, the people managing the company see value 
in us. Um, and every company's got that person that's been there for 15 years. And they were hired as, like, a... I don't know. Maybe they used to be good. Or they were hired as a mistake. And, and, and they're senior to you because they've been there longer. But they also have this really kind of massive blind spot in their experience because they've only been working for one company the whole time. And you might be bringing in things that are new and different and they might not like new and different and then you're going to come into conflict with them and then you're going to have to find a way to make that work. You can't always just leave the company, that happens. But sometimes you don't want to leave the company because sometimes everything else in the company is worth doing. Uh, so what we then need is the ability to actually work with people. And the other thing is, we're going to get people who are good at different things. Being able to identify who's good at what and who can do what is actually really important because then, like, intelligence is not a straight line scale. There is no one who is strictly smarter than someone else. I can go to every single one of you and we can have a chat and I can find out something that you're better than me at. We should be also, hopefully, be able to find something I'm better than you at. There is no such thing as someone who's strictly smarter than someone else. Um, there is only skills that you've picked up and you may have some skills that you've picked up and someone else may have different skills they've picked up and there's going to be some asymmetry between you. Um, it is incredibly rare that anyone's going to be able to say, I am better at everything that can possibly be done than someone else. Um, I don't know the magical situation where that could even potentially happen. Other than a shit-talking conversation where you're just kind of trying to say you're better than other people. Um, what have we got going on in there? <laughs> I solo made a game and it took so long. Yeah, I've never... Never. I've always worked with other people. Like, there's no way I want to do it on my own, right? Um, yeah, and Tom's talking about how having new hires that bring new new blood in is, is really interesting and really useful. <laughs> I don't know why that one was held for review. But someone said, what about a five-year-old? I reckon you can outskill them in anything. Can you outskill them in pure joy at seeing something just silly and funny that you've never seen before? Can you learn a brand new concept faster than they can? Because I'm, 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 I'm backing this up with science here. Brain plasticity, yours is not as flexible as theirs, guaranteed. Um, <laughs> being stubborn, yeah, and some and, and Patrick there has said flexibility, yeah. So there's a lot of interesting things there, right? Um, Paris is asking me about groups that disagree on how to do things. Um, yeah, and and people are backing me up in the comments. Yeah, so there you go. So you may think that you could outdo a five year old in many things. Um, oh yeah, the other thing was like just physical flexibility. Can you just stick your head between your feet while your knees aren't bent? Because I think a significant number of them can do that. Anyway, let's... <laughs> this reminds me of those conversations of, like, um, if you're locked in a room with, like, 55-year-olds, could you win a fight against them? And it's just like, oh, my God. We can't talk about that. We can't talk about beating up children. But it's just one of those really funny things. But we're not going to go there. Okay, so, details on teamwork. So... One of the things that's most important is sharing and compromise, right? These are things that we don't teach you technically, right? These are about the idea that you don't want anyone in the team to own an idea. I mean, sometimes you want to give credit to someone who came up with it first, but you really don't want to end up in a situation where someone holds onto an idea so tightly that they can't have it changed. Like, ideas ideas are cheap as well. I mean, I had this this thing, okay, a lot of my, a lot of my examples are always about making games because that's, um, that's a lot of my background and I care a lot about games. Um, if I was to ask anyone in this chat, I'll give you an hour, come up with a hundred game ideas, you'll be able to do it. 
and we could come up with a hundred game ideas and every single one of them could potentially be a hit and make a whole lot of money um, which just shows you how cheap ideas are they're worth nothing uh, so it's no point hanging on to your ideas what you hang on to is the the capability to actually create the idea the capability to implement it the capability to tear it to pieces so that it becomes better and this is something that's important so every idea you have instead of saying this is my idea I love it to pieces it's the best idea in the world it must be used as the best idea in the world what you should say with your ideas for how things should be solved is here is a way I think we could solve this problem here is a way I think we, should, we could make this app we need to tear this thing apart we need to destroy this idea we need to chip away at it and we need to find out everything that's wrong with it and then if it's still worth doing at the end of that then it's good and you need a team to do that you need a whole bunch of people around you to, to pick at that idea this happens in, um, in a lot of TV and movies as well well, less so in movies Ah, I'm just poking fun at Hollywood. Thank you, Disney, for consolidating all of Hollywood into one company. Um, <laughs> I love, like, real talk from Mark. It's just, like, random opinions from me. Um, most movies have, like, about 40 or 50 scripts before the one that actually gets filmed. Um, because what they'll do is they'll first throw away a whole bunch of different scripts that are in the same genre when they're wanting to make, say, a genre film. Um, and then of the few that survive that, they'll chop and change them multiple times before they'll consider it good enough to actually get towards implementation. And generally when we're problem solving with programming, we should actually be thinking the same way. Have lots of ideas, tear them to pieces. And this involves compromise. This involves letting go of your ideas. There, there's a design phrase called kill your darlings. So those things that you love the most, those things that you've held onto these amazing, I had this idea for an app and it'll be great. Um, those are the ones you really want to have a group around you to tear apart. So the trick is, can you, can you tear apart your own ideas? And then can you acknowledge other ideas if those ideas you think are superior to your own? Can you go in somewhere and can you actually hold back from what you know is right? I'm putting that in quotes because that's bullshit as well. Nobody knows anything is right. People think something is right, and people want to adhere to certain things, and they want to put a lot of effort into doing things a certain way. But every single one of those people has been proven wrong by time. So when I studied computer science, we were all about object-oriented programming. It was like the big thing back then, and it was super important. Um, and we knew things as facts. So one fact that I knew is that computers couldn't do face recognition. It was just beyond capability. We thought it would be a cool thing in the future. Now it's on everything. My little phone can do it, you know? Um, and so everything that you believe strongly in, the rules for how you should do things, chances are they will fade away over time. Something else will come up to replace it. I mean, when I started computing, Agile didn't exist. We were taught the waterfall method. You do the first bit, make sure the first bit works, then go on to the second bit. Make sure the second bit works, go on to the third bit. Nowadays, we're like... Go back and forth, do everything, uh, do whatever needs to be done, test it all, do it again, do it again, do it every couple of weeks, you know, fast sprints, teams that jump between things as they need to and things like that. So I was taught engineering as like a very kind of careful beast that walks a straight line. You've been taught engineering like a flock of butterflies that bounces around between different flowers, figures out which one's best, and then homes in on it only after you've, you know, had a good run around and tested things. I prefer the second way of doing it, so I've worked my way towards that over the years, but I had to retrain, and I had to forget the things that I thought I knew were correct. And so that's why I've got this line in here about following someone else's style and structure. So even, like, someone just throws a style guide at you and you just go, no, that's wrong. You're just using your brackets wrong. I'm not going to do it. And then they go, okay, we're not going to work with you then. You know, and if we consider this in a professional perspective, that's you saying, I'm going to stake my job on the style guide. <laughs> it's like, why'd you put so much effort to get into this company if you were just going to put your foot down and say, I don't want to work with you, right? So 
I think one of the biggest things we can learn about teamwork is that we need to put aside a lot of the things that we we could potentially be uncompromising on. There's a lot of things that we can be all like, oh, I believe it has to be this way. And it's like, okay. But bear in mind that those beliefs are limited in time. And you may be limiting yourself by stopping other people from being able to work properly by doing that. Um, oh no, people have started talking about the exam. You know I haven't finished designing that thing yet. I don't think it's worth talking about that just yet. Um, <laughs> random opinions as all of YouTube I'll fit right in. Okay, um, I realize now that I actually need to get through my slides rather quickly because I've gone way over time. Um, um, okay, the, the thing that's most important about teamwork, so I was talking at the beginning about the example of getting all these people in a room, putting them together, and, um, and trying to figure out which teams are going to work or not. What ended up being most successful was the teams that were the most willing to uplift other team members who were struggling or help team members that weren't able to cope at the same level as themselves were the most successful teams. And long term, that is definitely the case. Um, because getting along is far more important than being good at stuff. Because if you're getting along, your team is happy, your team cares about what they're doing, then it doesn't matter how good they are now, because they're going to get better. If your team has like one hotshot that thinks they're better than the whole team, and they won't accept anyone else's work except for their own, I know you're out there. I know you're out there. I know you've done it before. I've done it before. Uh, <laughs> I do it all the time. <laughs> Those teams aren't very good. Because they're only as good as that person, and that person's only one person, and I don't put a team of five people together to get one person's worth of work out of it. And that team always tanks when that person thinks that they're too good for the team and then they leave. Um, actually, no, they don't always tank. Sometimes they get much, much better. Because <laughs> very often the person is like, I did all the work, everyone else is just slacking off, I did all the work, they're usually the problem. <laughs> and I know this is going to trigger a lot of people, and I apologise. Um, but we do need to think about that sometimes. Is that if you are better than everyone else, then maybe your job is to get everyone else to be as good as you. And teaching is one of the highest professions in the world. Um, you also get much better at stuff if you teach it. So I think that's a lot about the teamwork is that if your team gets along and your team helps each other, it doesn't matter how good you are because you'll get better. Um, if your team is very good, but they can't work without conflict, um, they're uncompromising about things and, you know, they stick to their rules instead of, um, instead of being flexible with things, then that's a team that is going to have a lot of trouble um, reacting to an environment well. Uh, one of the best things, I think this was a Forbes article from, from many years ago, was it said that your next uh, IT manager is going to be a World of Warcraft guild leader. And I was like, ah, oh, yes, beautiful. I've Obviously, I like that because I've been a guild leader in World of Warcraft and I knew how hard it was. Um, and you can get a lot of this good experience in things like um, CSC SOC, CSC Review, any other student societies, especially situations where you've got a bunch of volunteers. So you've got people working with you or for you who are not being paid. Because there's nothing harder and getting someone who's not being paid to do something they don't want to do, right? But that involves getting some commitment from people, and that involves giving back to these people who are doing things for you without pay. Thank you, CSC Slark, and thank you, the new stew reps as well, because I know that there's like, you know, there's resources going into those things, but we're not paying you a wage for what you do there. You're just doing a whole lot of hard work um, because you care about it. Um, so those teams teach us a lot about not only supporting everyone in the team because they're not in it for the money, they're in it because they care about things. The other thing is, when you're all at the same level, 
because you're all students. There's no one there with like 20 years of experience who's in CSE stuff going, okay, this is a good way to run an organization of this size. Um, I know this because I've proven it at like, you know, IBM or something like that, right? You don't have that experience. So you're just going off hope a lot of the time, um, which means that who is in charge moves around daily. You don't have one manager with all this experience who just sort of delivers the experience to everyone and gives them all a chance to learn and then and then lets them grow into it eventually. You're just going to have to look around the people around you and go, who knows how to do this? All right, you're in charge for the next week while we do this. And then you bounce around to someone else, you know. And strangely enough, that's a very agile way of working, right? So good teams, teams that support each other, teams that can make compromises for each other, um, and teams that can, um, can adapt well to different things by changing who's in charge and changing the focus of the team and that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, okay, I'm going to have to go on. Because now I've only got half an hour left and there's heaps of stuff that I want to do. Um, ooh. That's a difficult one. How do we do team motivation or class motivation? Finding something that is the reason why people are doing something. Super, super difficult. Um, again, I say, this is the way I get students motivated. So when I have students coming to me personally and saying, okay, I don't know what to do. The first thing I ask them is, what do you want? You know, what do you want to do? What do you want to be? Does doing this align with what you want to do and what you want to be? Um, and if it does, then good. And if it doesn't, then maybe they need to go look for another thing that fulfills them or look for another thing that is what they actually want to do. Um, the, the way in and out of that also is if someone says they do want to do it, then mentally they'll start committing to it. Um, so this is an interesting exercise you can do with all your subjects is ask yourself um, why you are doing any subjects that you're doing. Every single subject you pick, ask yourself why you're doing that. And if your answer is, oh, it's core to my degree, I don't have a choice, then ask yourself why you're doing the degree, because you're doing the degree for a reason. Everyone's at university for some kind of goal. I mean, I guess some people are at university because it was the next thing to do after high school, and then after that, you get a job, and then after that, you get married, and after that, you pump out a couple of kids, and after that, or maybe before that, you get a mortgage. And then you lock yourself into a life and you pay off your mortgage and you look after your kids and stuff. That's actually quite fulfilling, by the way. That's actually a really nice life. But <laughs> especially if you got to keep your job the whole time. Um, but um, it's different for different people, right? You need to figure out why you're there. If you can figure out why you're doing something, then you know what it is you want to do. Anyway. I need to keep going because I said I was going to finish this by one. So I'm going to keep going. We're, we're probably going to go over time because I've got heaps of slides and I've been talking about lots of other things past the slides. Okay, resilience. This is one that I think... Um, I think is going to resonate a lot more with people who, who are studying now because you're not working yet and so some of the other things aren't necessarily happening. Give me a second. Sorry. I'll be right back. Did you want to go through? Yeah, sure. I don't know if she wants to go through or if she wants to play with me. I'll let her go through. I'm not done. I'm taking a very short break. Yeah, yeah, sure. Be quick. Okay, I'm closing the door again. No, it's not live. You can come through now if you need to, but... Are you recording now? Yes. Oh, okay. I'm not recording it, but it's on YouTube now. It's live. How can you have a oh. live lecture?
That was pretty funny. I don't know if anyone's listening to that, but I'm pretty sure my my mic was live while I was there. It's like... <laughs> All right, um, just ignore anything that just happened while I was supposed to have my mic muted. Okay, let me just move my face over here for the moment. <laughs> okay, so... This is something that's going to come up a lot. Because... Um... <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> doing well. I'm doing well at this whole streaming thing. Yeah, so me saying that I'm not live, where I'd only switched the visuals over, but not the microphone. Okay. This is something that happens to a lot of people as graduates. Because a lot of companies don't treat their graduates with a great deal of respect. I mean, heaps of companies do. So don't... Don't get me wrong, but there's something to look into. Um, whether you're a graduate or not doesn't even matter, because this is going to happen to a lot of people. Um, <laughs> 80 hour work week, I hate my job, this is fine. This is something that people get into a lot, and they get into this idea of like crunch as well, where you get given a deadline and it is, it's just straight out infeasible or impossible, um, and you're asked to do something with it anyway. This is something that, funnily enough, I learnt this working in theatre, not working in computing. I have several, several other lives behind this uh, computer science lecturer thing, so I was working in, in professional theatre for a while. Um, I've got two full-length albums I recorded as a musician, also. They're going to be nearly impossible to find, don't bother. Um, and other things like that, and this painting stuff that I do nowadays as well. Um, one of the things I learnt in theatre, and this is especially something that happened because um, the audience comes into the theatre, the show has to start. So if your show is not ready, it goes on not ready. You don't ever have a choice. Um, and so this is why I've got this line here. Failure is inevitable. It's inevitable. Somewhere in time, in the projects that you do, something's going to go wrong. I mean, we know this. Right? We're computer scientists. We live with failure. We, we spend a very short amount of time writing code and a very long amount of time trying to make that code work. So this is something that we, we get used to in a big way. And what I want to say about failure, and this is for anyone who, who fails a subject in their degree, that this is this idea of failure, or anyone who, who loses a job for any reason, or, um, or just stuffs up an assignment, you know, you just get to a point where you go, I just, I just didn't do a good job on that one. I don't really mind, you know, I mind if you cheat, <laughs> but I don't mind if, if you do a bad job, because it's not really about whether you did a good job or a bad job, it's what you do afterwards that counts, because at some point stuff's going to go wrong, and the thing that counts the most is not, um, not whether or not there was a failure, but how you bounce back afterwards, because there is no learning without failure. We put you in situations intentionally so that you will fail. That's what teachers do. Because if you fail here and now at university while we're here to help you, that's a good time to fail. If you manage to get through the whole of university without ever doing anything wrong, and then the first time you do something wrong is when, the, when you're getting paid to do it, you failed when the stakes were high, it's much better to fail when the stakes are low, you know? Um, and so you learn how to totally screw something up and then bounce back and go, ah, there's another way around this. I can do better at this. You're allowed to take a subject more than once, you know? Tell that to everyone who got laid off at Bioware after Mass Effect Andromeda. I don't know if these examples mean anything to anyone else, but they mean a lot to me. Mass Effect Andromeda was a game that just, it just tanked because they released it too early and so they released it with these god-awful bugs. Like, visible, hugely visible god-awful bugs. Um, and so the game got slammed in the press and stuff like that and a lot of people lost their, lost their livelihood over that. They lost their work and stuff over that. I'd much prefer you make those kinds of mistakes uh, here where even if you fail a subject, um, you can come back next time, do it again. 
all you lose is a small amount of time, you know? Um, and honestly, I think someone said, this is when I started engineering, like, last, last century. <laughs> engineering can either be the worst four years or the best six years of your life. It was a pretty good five years for me in my four year degree. Um, I was quite happy with that. Uh, you can do things in a more chill way and still be happy with things. If you spend an extra year at CSE at university, you're spending an extra year somewhere that's actually kind of a nice place to be. Your marks end up higher, and then when you go out there into the world, you know more because you spent the time to learn things deeper. I'm not saying that everyone needs to extend their degrees and go slower or anything like that, but if you're feeling a lot of pressure and you're feeling like there's too many subjects to do at once, um, yeah, you don't have to you don't have to finish on time. There's no such thing as on time. And the idea of like when you graduate and stuff like that it really doesn't mean much. Anyway, more real talk from Mark. Oh, there's a whole bunch of talk over here. <laughs> Someone knows Mass Effect. Um, All right, I'm going to let you talk amongst yourselves there. I think that's kind of handy. Um, okay, specific Comp 1511 questions there. I'm going to talk, take them at a, at, a, at a separate time. But that question about auto tests and stuff might be a good one to talk about tomorrow when I'm doing a pure coding stream. Um, yeah, and Tom's saying you can talk on Ed about that stuff because then we can probably help other people with the answers to that question as well. Um, yeah, okay, so, oh wait, the other thing with resilience is when you get given an impossible task. So for example, let's say assignment one in comp 1511, I give you that and ask you to do that, but you're not ready for it. You don't feel ready for it, you don't feel like you can, you can achieve it. So I have this example of what I used to do, um, I used to play a lot of pool, you know, pool, I have, can you see that? Yeah, playing pool, with the stick that hits the balls, played in a lot of pubs in Australia, you can't play it now because all the pubs are shot, which is sad, um, but necessary, okay, don't go out, don't touch people, I'm just going to keep saying that, keep washing your hands. <laughs> um, I used to have this thing where I'd get, end up in impossible situations while playing pool, like there was no good way I could think of hitting my ball to hit the ball that I wanted to hit because there's other stuff in the way or something like that. What I used to do in those situations is I would plan for something that was like a 1% chance of succeeding. So I go, I'm going to reflect it off this cushion on the side here, bounce it back, it's going to hit that one, then it's going to hit that other one, and it's going to sink it. And people would just be saying like, why are you even bothering, man? Like, there's no way you can make that shot. And it's like, this isn't about whether I can make that shot. This is about me not slipping into despair. And it's a very, very different way of approaching the world. This is me deciding that I'm going to control what I can control, even if it's not great control, and even if there's not much I'm necessarily going to change in the world, I'm not going to let myself slip into a point where I say, there's no hope. So, in a world with no hope, it doesn't matter what I do, because I never want to live in that world, you know? And this is probably good advice for going into lockdown in a pandemic. There's not much that you can change. Um, you don't get the choice to go outside and meet your friends. You can't go to a pub, you can't go to the shops, they're all shut. So what are you going to do to make your life um, still worth living? I've been doing virtual dinner parties. It's kind of fun. So a bunch of us will be cooking food in our own homes with our webcams or our laptops and we're just talking to each other or over our phones and then we sit, sit down at the table and put the laptop there on the table and it's got like a couple of our friends' faces there and we'll talk to them about things that are happening uh, via a virtual connection because it's, it's what we can do in this situation to get people together. Um, so my, my short bit of that is like have a plan even if the situation seems impossible and you don't have to solve an entire problem in an impossible situation. Take the parts of it you can solve and solve them in time and get a solution that's sort of good enough and that'll have to be enough. Because it was an impossible situation anyway. So don't try to push all the way to the difficult thing that you're not gonna get. Just go to what you can. 
Um, and at least you'll have achieved something in that impossible situation, rather than sort of giving up and then losing your ability to, to, to do anything. So it's kind of like this idea that when we're in a situation where there's no rational kind of way out of it, if we can still approach it rationally and think about the problem a little bit rationally, um, we can put our effort into it. Even if that's not enough to solve it, um, at least we're going to get something out of that. We might learn something from it, even in a situation of inevitable failure, rather than giving up in a situation of inevitable failure and learning nothing. Um, Oh, uh, there's argument about the assignment and stuff like that. So, I wouldn't ever say that some people who I am not can or can't do something. I don't even say I can or can't do something. So, I wouldn't want to put words in other people's mouths by saying that different people can or can't do anything. Um, and also, um, I would also say that things like stages in the assignment and, and everyone's going to be looking at the assignment. Like, there's a whole meta going on here on the assignment. People go, where do you get the most marks and stuff like that? And, like, which bits to work on, which bits get harder than other bits. Um, I don't mind, because I'm going to give passing marks to people who only complete stage one. And I'm quite happy with doing that, because that's the base competency level that I require at this point in time. Um, if people want to go for things like stage four and stuff like that, that's you making a decision about your time and the amount of marks that you could earn. I would argue that you will nearly definitely get more marks by pre-studying for the exam than you will out of doing something like stage four in the assignment. Um, for some of you, doing stage four in the assignment is studying for the exam because it's things that you think you're going to use in the exam. Um, for some of you doing stage four in the assignment is I don't care about marks, I want to learn cool stuff, so I'm going to do it. So I'm never really going to say that anyone should or shouldn't do all of the bits or part of the bits in an assignment. I'm saying you do what you want to do. And if the assignment looks like an impossible situation to you, you choose how far you want to go. I have no expectation that 100% of the class should reach the end of the assignment. It's obviously not designed that way, right? There's stuff in there that is like challenge exercises, which we haven't even asked people to do. <clears throat> those are those are for your benefit. So anyway, that's a little bit of a sidetrack. Um, just because people were talking about our Comp One Five One One assignment in the in the chat there. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit more about resilience in a second, um, but I do want to go through my four points first because I still haven't gone through the four points I was talking about. To be honest, I much prefer this way of delivering this lecture than trying to squeeze it in to like half an hour or 45 minutes that I've had to do in the past when it was a traditional 1511 lecture. Technical skills. So after we have checked you to see whether you can communicate your ideas to non-programmers, whether we think you're able to work in a team, compromise, uplift other people in your team, and, and whether you, and so this isn't necessarily what you're hired for, but this is something you would think about, whether you think that you're going to be happy and surviving in a job with difficult situations in it. The thing that comes after that is things like technical skills. And yes, I put this last in the list. The reason I put it last in the list is you don't really have a choice. You're going to learn these technical skills whether you like it or not because you're doing a comp sci degree. Or similar, whatever degree you're doing, you're going to learn technical skills. <coughs> Oops, my picture is in the way of... I got, I'm going to have to keep... Oop. I'll move it over there now. There you go. Um, thank you for reminding me that. Um, put my webcam on top of Steven Crowder's neck. Hang on, hang on. Hang on, wait a minute. Freeze frame that one. <laughs> okay. I put this last because these are kind of inevitable. By the time you get to the end of your degree, you're going to have some of these whether you like it or not. 
I put them last on the list in this particular lecture because um, it's important. But if you focus too hard on this, it's going to be very difficult for you to actually solve problems. It's not going to be that difficult for you to like write code. But writing code isn't just writing code. Like no one gets hired just to write code. They get to write. They get hired to write specific code, tying in with other people's code, and meeting a specification that is constantly changing because um, the more we go through a project and the more parts of the problem we solve, the more the space of the problem changes. Um, so your ability to actually deal with that ties into things like communication and, um, and teamwork. So yes, your technical skills are there. You're probably gonna pick up a lot of these anyway. Um, but I put these last in the list because again, that's not actually often what people are hiring for. Every now and then people are hiring for this. But if I have someone who's technically brilliant and can't communicate, then chances are they're going to write a lot of code that I don't need. Um, I would prefer hiring someone who is much slower, um, but talks to me about everything that they do. Or, or just someone who's flat out worse at coding, but but has good communication links back and forth because then we can talk about what we're doing and make sure we're on track all the time. The person who never talks to me goes off for three weeks, does a whole lot of coding, brings me back something that doesn't work for me. I've just lost three weeks of one person's time to that. Whereas if I have someone who, who literally writes a quarter of the amount of code as that other person, but comes back to me every couple of days and says, okay, this is where we're at. Um, this is what I'm thinking about next. Um, what do you reckon? What's our, what's our direction here? Is more likely to produce something for me that I can use. So that's why the technical skills aren't even that high in the, um, <coughs> in the overall scheme of things here. Okay. So I want to talk a bit more about this resilience and surviving thing. So this was aimed at Comp 1511 students, this particular slide. Um, talking about having an assignment due soon, but I should say everyone's got an assignment due soon because all the subjects have their first assignment due sometime around week six or seven usually. Um, whether you succeed or not in the assignment is not based on the amount of marks that you get at the end of the assignment, it's based on what you are aiming for in the assignment and what you were thinking about getting done. Um, the other thing is just game the hell out of it if you want to. Look for the places where you can get the most marks with the least amount of time. This is good training. So when we have a deadline and we want to get something out by that deadline and we know we're not going to get all the features out in time, we look for reasons why features are in an app and we say, I want these features in because they're important. Um, these other features are easy to put in, they're quick. Um, and then you can rank all the different features you could put into an app based on how useful they are to solve the problem and how easy they are to build. And then you tick off the ones that are going to get you the most payoff for the app with the least amount of effort. And this is exactly the same thing you do with the assignment. Look at the things that are going to earn you the most marks with the least amount of effort and do them first. And then go on to the harder things later. This is how we work with deadlines. And then when you get to the deadline, you go, okay, this is what we've got. Win or lose, doesn't matter. This is what we've got. This is what we were able to create in this time. We try to make this really easy on you in assignments where we just say, here's the first things you should do, and then here are the second things you should do. So we've kind of done your priority for you, but you can still kind of change your priority. It's much easier to get marks with uh, code style in a lot of assignments than it is to get marks with um, difficult technical things. So people are talking about different stages on um, uh, on stuff like the Comp 1511 assignment. Um, stage 4 has, I think, less marks in it than Code Style does, if I remember correctly. Because Stage 4 will take you from an 85 to 100, um, depending on your level of completion of Stage 4. Code Style can take you from, um, from 80 to 100. So, uh, if you're thinking about what's more important, we did that on purpose, right? Because it is more important that your code is readable uh, than it is functional. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, you can choose how you're going to do things based on the on what you need to do. And then this way, this is exactly the same as me saying earlier that um, 
in an impossible situation, you still do what you can. So in an impossible situation where your release date is in 24 hours and the thing flat out doesn't work, you need to figure out which things you can do in those 24 hours to get it working to a certain level so that when you hit the button and you release it, um, it's got at least something that was advertised on the box before you had to release it. So the thing that I want to talk about is like trying to get what you can achieve without burning out. So I always laugh about this because I'm trying to tell people not to pull all-nighters. Um, if you work in a company where you're pulling all-nighters, and this honestly goes back to this one, it's not sustainable. You know, it's not the kind of thing you can keep doing and expect your mental health to just sort of survive it. Um, so, I don't know. I would love it if people never had to do all-nighters, but again, I give you deadlines. So, if you, if you can, I mean, I have to give you deadlines because people are going to give you deadlines later, and so I need to train you to be able to deal with them. But the thing I want you to try to do when you're dealing with deadlines is to get what you can done, done, prioritize what you can do so that when the deadline reaches, you don't have some kind of random chunk of something unfinished. You've got a series of, of finished parts um, that may not score a whole lot of marks, but they're what you could do at the time and they're with a the maximum amount of marks you could do with the time you had. This is a skill that's gonna take a while to learn. Um, you're going to have to get this wrong a few times before it starts come, getting right, but it's a really valuable skill. Um, and I've got no space. Oh, wait, there's space for me here. No, no, I want to be the good one. Yeah. So this is what I was talking about before. Panic is the kind of thing that burns you out. Panic is the kind of thing that makes you feel like um, you're not doing the right thing or you shouldn't be doing this or um, that everything's a failure. You don't always have to and the way to get out of that feeling is to take a systematic approach to problems, especially problems you can't solve. I mean, like, if you can solve the problem and you can see how to solve the problem, I don't need to give you a set of steps over here. Uh, I can just wave at the things because I put myself in the middle of the screen. Um, you don't have to you don't have to lose it every time something difficult happens. You can take these steps. And I mean, I know I know that's a horrible thing to say because if you if you are losing it and you are panicking, um, it's okay. It's totally fine. We all do it and we all do it all the time just let it go ride it out don't fight the panic go all out with it come out on the other side and then have a look at these steps first thing you need to do is you need to give your brain a rest take a moment to breathe i wrote a big document which i may do in a future workshop for csc sock about debugging and the first piece of advice i had for people for debugging is to just walk away walk away from the problem do something else have a nap have a shower, something. You need to get your head out of that headspace so that you can then start thinking about things in a different way. Because you're obviously in a headspace where you couldn't solve the problem. So you need to get yourself into a different headspace where you can solve the problem. So once we have gotten to that and we want to try to start solving a problem, figure out what your options are. Any system, any system you're working in, which is like programming or engineering or just getting through university, there's switches that you can flick. There's things that you have control of, and there's other things that are going to happen to you you don't have control of. Don't worry about things that aren't going to happen that, that you don't have control of. Worry about things that you have control of. So figure out what you can do. And that doesn't. And, and here you can see I don't even care about solving the problem. I'm just figuring out what I can do. And then if I can break down a big difficult problem into smaller parts, and I can say I can do these bits of it, then go ahead. You can do those little bits of it. You can complete parts of this thing without completing the whole. And you're still going to get something out of that. And um, and in the end, aim for enough to make you happy about what you're doing. Um, complete enough that 
you've got something going, and even if that doesn't get you many marks, you've at least worked towards something, and hopefully you learned something along the way. Because the only thing that really matters is your learning stuff. You can be failing subjects, but if you're learning stuff about it, it means you can come back again and you'll do better, and that's fine. So, you could work like crazy. I had a student who was like this. Um, he used to pick the the hardest way possible to do something. I think he was trying to show off, I don't know. But he never finished. Like, he never finished any of his assignments. He would just hand in things with lofty ideals that just never completed. Um, and then I had other students who were like, technically not as smart as this guy who always got higher marks than him because they aimed for what they could do and they aimed enough, aimed to learn from everything they're doing. And they ended up better than him in the end of things. And so this is an issue that I think that a lot of people get into is like, I want to make my mark. I want to, I want to do amazing things. I'm going to do amazing things in every single assignment. <laughs> it's just like, oh my God, really? Yeah, death wish, you know, like there's other things you can do with your time that might be more valuable than trying to prove yourself at every single step of the way. So, working crazy on the hardest thing than failing is a really, really horrible way to hurt yourself. Um, you, it's like you're making yourself fail in a situation where you weren't going to otherwise. And I said failure is okay, but I feel like if you do this, think about what you're going to do next time. It's more important. Or, wait, hang on, it's that hand. Aiming for just enough that makes you happy. There you go. There's another freeze frame meme there for you if you want. I don't think I tipped my head the right way, but it's okay. Okay. So question, who can become a professional? You're all there at the moment thinking, I am a student. I have a lot to learn. I am not professional yet. Um, and the question is, can I become a professional? Can I attain these magical skills that Mark is talking about? And, and, and make my way into the professional computing community or whatever professional community you want to get into and can I get there? And the answer is yes. Flat out. Yes. <laughs> so if you want to ask who out of you can become a professional, all of you. There's, there's no... There's no magic. Um, and so I've got these points here and these points are like... <laughs> I just love them because... Wait, wait, hang on. Yeah, I want to be the cat. Um, <clears throat> no one knows what they're doing. I do not know what I'm doing. Okay, so there's, there's a concept that you'll hear about, and it's one that's really worth looking into. It's called imposter syndrome. Where all of these people who are like the smartest people in the world, um, they look at their fields that they're working in and they see someone else doing something better than them and they go, I shouldn't be here. Um, this is made a lot worse by culture in, in a lot of the companies that we might work in and stuff. Like, I don't know if anyone's heard of the Silicon Valley Dude Bros. Um, it's a culture that pervades Silicon Valley where there's this sort of possibly not even real group oh, there is real, there's lots of them but <laughs> group of people who um, believe that they are the chosen ones and they're the ones that can do coding and they're the ones that can do tech startups um, and and other people are not worthy of doing it and you're going to get this like, you're going to get this for all kinds of different reasons um, your people are going to get told because of how they look, because of how they choose to live their life, or because of the environment they grew up in, or other things like that, that they're not worthy, or they're not, they're not capable of becoming tech professionals, and that is absolute fucking bullshit. So, <laughs> I don't swear usually in my lectures, but I think that that's a point where I need to. Um... There's no reason why you can't be a professional. Um, there's no reason why you can't excel in the fields you want to be in. And there's especially no reason why anyone else has a right to tell you that you can't. You know? If someone tells you that there are certain skills that you might need to learn, then yeah, that's good feedback. That's useful. If someone tells you you could never do it, 
then I think that they're projecting their own issues on you. Maybe they're just scared that you will do it, and then you'll show that they're that they're wrong, and then you can be better than them at, at, at some of the things that they do. You know, um, any of you can do it. And the trick behind this is that everyone thinks that they can't. No one has a single clue what's going on or what they're doing. And if they look like they know what they're doing, they're probably hiding it. Or they're hiding it from themselves, which is even worse. An example of this... Every time I give this talk... So... I don't know, I've given it informally several times, and now formally at UNSW, this is my fifth time doing this. So you'd expect that if I've done something for the fifth time that I'm pretty happy with it, and I'm good at it, and I can just do it. I was very scared about delivering this. So last night, when I was finishing off the slides, I was very scared about delivering this. I stayed up late for no reason, because I was stressed. And then I woke up late this morning, didn't have a chance to go over the slides, and just sort of went, oh, I'm just gonna have to, I'm just gonna have to do it. And things are gonna go wrong, and I'm just gonna have to, I'm gonna have to do this anyway. And like, you know, like, my stomach is like, was turning over and stuff like that. Um, people think that because I'm a lecturer, I know what I'm doing. I don't. The best I can do is just try to be honest about things. So every time I deliver a lecture, I'm just trying to be as honest as I can be and showing that I don't actually understand everything. And this is really funny, right? Because I'm teaching introductory computer science. People assume that I should know everything, but you've seen this. People have asked me questions in lectures and stuff, and I'm going, I'm not really sure what happens when we do that. Like, I don't know the compiler inside out. I don't know how C works inside out. C is not actually my native language, but I, I'm a C++ native speaker, which is like knowing Latin. <laughs> I know an ancient dead language that only some people use. Um, and so I have to translate things into C, and there'll be all these mistakes I make, which are, going, which are coming up, because in the later weeks, there's things that C and C++ do very differently, and I'll make more mistakes in the later weeks. Um, yeah, so me along with everyone else you think is good at what they do and is successful and stuff, we're all there kind of saying, I don't know how to do this, I'm not sure what I'm going to do, and um, I'm just figuring it out as I go along. Um, and also, every single person who has learned from me can, can, can know for absolute certain that they learned an imperfect version of what Mark had to offer. Because every time I've taught something afterwards, I've looked at it and said, I could have done that in a different way, and I write down some notes. So, Term 1, 2019, that was me just dropped into UNSW for the first time. So there's people who were there, and there's people who got something out of that, but I can say for certain that you got an inferior version of the people who are learning at this term. Uh, this term, people are getting uh, better teaching than you got, and I apologize for that. It's because I didn't know what I was doing. And I still don't know what I was doing, and I apologize to the people learning from me now, because whoever learns from me afterwards is undoubtedly going to get a better course than you did. Um, I have to be okay with this, because it's a good thing, because it means I'm improving things as I'm going along, but I've got to be okay with things not being perfect all the time. And if you're okay with your stuff not being perfect all the time, if you're okay with the fact that you're going to be learning things as you go along, um, that is you being a good professional. That's all you need, you know. So, no one knows what they're doing. Everyone's making it up as we go along. You will too. And hopefully you will share this kind of thing with people around you as well. So that it's more okay for us all to be making this up as we go along. And we're not making up magical fucking boundaries where we say that only some people can be good coders. And you're going to get this, right? You're going to get this because you went to UNSW. So you went to UNSW. You went through CSE. You're like this elite. You're not, by the way. <laughs> I've met some amazing coders <clears throat> who were studying from General Assembly and stuff like that, you know? Like, quick, 
little courses in these little colleges and stuff like that. And they'll coat the pants off you, if you let them. Um, and everyone from different places are going to learn different things, and so there is no elite. There is no people who are undoubtedly better than other people. They may have more experience. You may have a lot of things you want to learn from people. That doesn't make them more worthy of being a human being than you. Right? And that's something that I really want to get through. And I think this is where this whole now more than two hours of talking takes me to. Is that it doesn't matter what you don't know. Because there's heaps of stuff that we all don't know. There's more stuff in computer science than any of us can ever know. It's about what we want to learn. And it's about what we want to progress and things like that. So as long as you're always looking for things that you want to learn about and looking for things that you want to um, that you're interested in and also taking breaks and sometimes not looking for things that you want to learn and just being like okay for a while I just want to chill I'm just going to do the things I know how to do that's totally fine as well because we do that as well all these people that you consider to be like successful people a lot of them are just like a massive bundle of failure and mistakes <laughs> and they got to where they are through that and that's fine um and so I think that's one of the things that I really wanted to um, to really drive home today in this talk is that I, I don't really... Hang on, where is it? I don't care who you are, where you're from, or what you've done, as long as you love C. <laughs> it doesn't have to be C, it can be other programming languages as well. Um, I just, I just was leaning in towards that, so I thought I'd jump to this slide here. This is like one of my favorite slides um, that I've ever used. It's, it's obviously the cover of the uh, famous Backstreet Boys single here, and I haven't edited it at all. I haven't photoshopped it. This is exactly what it is. <laughs> Let me go back one slide, because I had something in this previous slide. I'm not sure where I was going to talk about it or not. Um, Okay, so the process of becoming a professional. Um, all right, I'm not covering up any of it. This sort of ties in the four things I was talking about at the beginning. So it doesn't have to happen yet, and it won't. There won't be a point where you just go, "Oh, now I'm professional, and I wasn't professional before." So personally, I act unprofessional a whole lot of the time. I think the last two hours I've been acting very unprofessional because I've been swearing in an official UNSW delivery thing, I've been a bit real talk, I forgot to turn off my microphone when I went on break, but none of those things are things that I want to hold me back. Right. So I'm okay with them. So, things to learn about when you're on this path to become a professional. Talk to people. Learn to communicate. Um, you don't have to be great at it. You don't have to be like, and this is the thing, it's like people go, he's great at talking. It's just because I'm a lecturer. I'm better at talking than I am at coding. Don't look at my code. <laughs> right? But you don't have to be as good at delivering concepts as a lecturer because that's my core job. Um, but you should be at least thinking about how you're going to communicate things. So practice talking about how your code works or even just drawing some diagrams about how your code works. The funniest thing about doing that is that you might teach yourself more about your code when you do it. You might draw a diagram of how, how your latest assignment works, and then you'll look at it and go, these things aren't connected up properly. I could do this better. And then suddenly you'll have perspective on how you want to shift things around. So it's not just good for other people. It might be good for yourself. When you're in a team, remember that the idea of a leader is just the idea of someone with more experience. It's not necessarily someone who's better than you at something. They've just been through more. And so they may give you advice because they've been through more, but then you always may find situations where you've been through things more than other people. And so a good team is going to move these things around. Um, and also a good team is going to help and support each other. I didn't put that in this slide, but I've got this here as well. Look after yourself also. Putting undue, undue pressure on yourself is something that I would hope that people try not to do. Because the world's going to put enough pressure on you as it is. You don't need to add to it. Um, and that's just one of the difficult things. Because I'm, like, 
university, the uni, uni, uni New South Wales or any other university, tertiary institutions, are, are pressure cookers. We put you in this thing and we put you under enormous amounts of strain and pressure. And if we're lucky, you all come out of it tasty and crispy like KFC. But for a lot of people, this kind of pressure is really difficult, right? And so I hope that you can find a way to navigate it. Because this pressure is a simulation of what commercial life might be or research life might be. Um, and hopefully it gives you a chance to work with this pressure in a situation where you can eventually learn to deal with it. So if you can't take it all on at once, don't take it all on at once. Learn to take it on gradually, uh, rather than trying to put maximum pressure on yourself for every single assignment. Ease into it. You don't have to finish every assignment, you know. You can work your way up to, to being able to deal with that level of pressure. Um, in 1511, that's why we have these weekly tests that are mini exam style things, so that when you get to the exam, you've got some experience with that kind of pressure. And the one thing that I want to say, and I think this is core to everything that I've spoken about today, is to care. Uh, it's more important than, than everything. And caring about people around you makes your communication better and your teamwork better. Caring about yourself means you're going to look after yourself, your resilience is better. Um, caring about the work that you do means you're going to put more effort into your technical skills and things like that as well. So caring is like the, like, it's a bigger deal than, than anything else I've spoken about today because it's the core ideal that then leads into these more specific things that I've been talking about. So please take care of yourself, especially in this whole lockdown. It's not social isolation, physical isolation thing that's happening. Um, and the pressure cooker of studying in a university environment. If you care about yourself, you care about the people around you, and you care about the work that you're doing, then you're going to be okay. You know, and that's, that's what I want to tell everyone is that things are going to be okay. Um, we're all going to find a way through this hopefully if we can you know or even if we don't find a way through through this like you decide that CSE is not something that you want to continue or finish you don't want to finish your degree here that's fine there's plenty of other things that people can do um, so I've got a friend who's working in Abu Dhabi at the moment he's just been shipped out because like um, it's a bit dangerous to keep continue work anywhere in the world at the moment um, but he goes around the world and, and works on some of the biggest sort of uh, um, events around the world. I try not to give away their identity. So he works on these huge events around the world. Uh, he didn't entirely finish his CSE degree. He never even tried to get a job doing CSE kind of things. Um, but he's highly successful in his career now and he's happy with what he's doing. Um, so there's a path for all of us if we can if we can find it and if we can care about what we're doing we're going to find a path that that is something that we want to do so that's kind of where i want to leave you um i hope that what i've spoken about today helps you navigate what you're what you're trying to do not just in your degree or in this subject in comp 1511 or in cse stuff just life in general because all of this stuff is about is it about us getting through things that we want to do while making sure that everyone else around us survives it as well um and not hurting anyone along the way including yourself we, hurt, we tend to hurt ourselves more than we hurt other people. I know that people are usually harsher on themselves than they are on other people. So, yeah, I've wrapped this thing up like three different times in three different ways now. So I think I'm just going to leave it there um, and say good luck to everyone um, and everything that you're doing. Um, there's no such thing as luck. <laughs> there is, but, you know. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't think I have anything more to say, but thank you for sticking around. I've gone over time. Um, 
but hopefully this kind of thing gets you to the point where you can walk your own path through study and life and being a professional. You don't have to follow what I'm saying either. You can walk your own path. Um, but as long as you're happy and confident to walk your own path, I think that's the most important thing. Okay. I'm going to wrap it up there. Um... Oh, there's some people here coming back and, and hearing it again and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I'll wrap it up there. Uh, for those of you who are in Comp 1511, I'm going to do a stream tomorrow afternoon, which is more technical, where we're actually going to look at coding stuff. I'm going to try to do at least one code project that wraps up the entirety of the first five weeks of the course and stuff like that. There's also a few surveys going out, and I know that this is probably the wrong place to publicize this, but we're asking for people to fill out some surveys for 1511 about uh, what level of connectivity you have and whether you can feasibly work from home. And I realize the deep irony of me asking you to fill out those surveys when I'm on a live stream, which is potentially the most taxing thing on people's internet connections. But we'll send out things that are... Um, not as synchronous as a live stream, and hopefully people will get that um, that information there. All right, thanks everyone. I will um, see some of you tomorrow afternoon for you in CSE talk and stuff like that. I'll probably see you on Facebook where I just randomly post on your posts there just for fun and stuff like that. All right, goodbye and good luck.